Welcome marketing chefs. I've got something truly special cooking in the Omni Channel oven today. It's a keynote presentation that I gave at the Asia CEO Forum on hyper-connected trends, consumers, and technology. Up next in the Marketing Kitchen. Welcome to the kitchen, the marketing kitchen. Hi, I'm Ron Vining, your host of Marketing Kitchen TV. I am very excited to share this keynote presentation with you that I gave at the Asia CEO Forum. My topic was hyperconnected trends, consumers, and technology. I want to highlight for you the topic of digital Darwinism, one that is near and dear to my heart because it touches all of us in our digital marketing space how we have reached that point of oversaturation that requires even greater spotlight than I could have ever even imagined at the time that I gave that speech. The speech is even more relevant today because I predicted we would reach a point in time where we would have content saturation, saturation to the point where it would be too difficult to break through. And we are at that stage today. I can attest to this as a marketer, that if I have brands that are just entering the market, for them to be able to crack in it's just so difficult. There is so much overcrowding, pollution, toxicity across Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn, Line, Snap, Twitter, WeChat. You name the channel, the noise is there. How do you get your message across to your consumer when there's so much noise, so much disruption happening? And that is why I created the Marketing Kitchen, to reach out, try to break through sort of cut across the noise to get to the consumer. More importantly, at the time that I gave that presentation, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, automation, transmedia storytelling, blockbuster, omni-channel content marketing, were really in their infancy. And today, those are the types of tools that we need. The reason why I've created the Marketing Kitchen to share with you the latest and greatest tips, tricks, hacks, marketing recipes, for you to be successful. Pair those with AI, automation, virtual reality, augmented reality, a hybrid online, offline strategy to engage your customer. Talk about online and offline engagement. This presentation is an example of what it is that I do. And a lot of people ask me, Ron, what do you do? And I'll try to simplify that. In addition to being a marketing professor, I am also an entrepreneur who has set up several businesses that offer brand advisory, market consultancy, corporate speaking, and corporate training. This keynote that I'm about to share with you was a corporate keynote that I gave on behalf of SAP. I was working with SAP on a consulting engagement, developing online channels for them to be able to engage with C-level decision makers to help sell their products in a non-selling way. To develop the online portion, which were the channels LinkedIn and Twitter, the offline aspect was live speeches, offering a Q&A opportunity, live engagement, where we invited C-level decision makers for them to hear the latest trends, how to engage your consumers, and which technology, and in that particular case being SAP, would be the best to deliver the message or deliver the service. That's one of the types of things that I do and you get to see it in action in this presentation. To heighten the engagement, I have included in the link here my slides on SlideShare. I hope you enjoy it. I want to cover the, the three topics. Uh, one is trends, the other is consumers, and the third is technology. For trends, I want to talk about content or the disruption that's happened because of content in the marketplace. The second idea is around digital Darwinism. It's a point that McKinsey has uh, done several studies on. And the final aspect, I'll talk about hyper-local targeting under technology. When we talk about content, I want to give uh, Marriott Hotels as the example to start this off at. Marriott has decided that they're going to do all of their advertising based on content to the point that they've recruited two Disney executives, 
or troop recruited away to Disney executives, and they've started up what's called Marriott Studios. So they're actually going to be producing their own films, their own TV shows, music videos, and they're looking to distribute that content across social media, across their own um, in-hotel entertainment, and also through their loyalty program on their app and through their website. So one of their first films, if you will, the Two Bellmen. And so you can uh, actually you can Google this, and so you can find uh, this up on YouTube. But it's just an example of uh, Marriott Studios looking to create compelling, original, or unique content as a differentiator against their competition. And how many people are fans of like exclusive TV shows that are on HBO or Showtime, something like Game of Thrones? If, you, if you're not a fan of it, perhaps you've heard of it. But original content like that drives you to HBO, like The Sopranos did before that, correct? So Marriott is looking to do something similar. Imagine if we get to the point where a TV series produced by St. Marriott is so popular that you'll only stay at a Marriott hotel just so that you can watch the program. It seems far-fetched, but perhaps that's where the market's going. Talking about content disruption, I want to tell you about, or share with you anyway, three different types of content to uh, take a look at that. The first is produced or user-generated content. And so produced, obviously, that is something where you either do it internally or you hire an you outsource and you have an agency do that for you. What we've been doing, that would basically be traditional media. We're looking at from the aspect of the example of Marriott, it's still produced content, but it's, it's a bit more audience-centric because it's more infotainment. But user-generated content, that's what we're doing every single day. So this morning, I, I got up, I took a picture outside of the window, and I wrote, good morning, Philippines. I'll be presenting SAP, uh, hyperconnected, blah, blah, blah. That is a form of user-generated content. SAP didn't pay me to send out that tweet. The hotel didn't pay me to send out that tweet, but I did. And each of them are then mentioned by that. And that is an example, simply, of user-generated content. We do it every day with photos, videos, uh, whatever we might be sharing or resharing of other content that we see. And you can see as I've been speaking with Gather, you've probably been reading some of the statistics that are behind me there. But we see that user-generated content is consumed to the point, especially with millennials, as many as five hours per day is just used looking at user-generated content. But you as a brand, when we're talking about content disruption, you either need to be producing content or fostering brand fans to, cre to create user-generated content or buzz about your, your products so that it's being just transmitted out there. If you're familiar with, uh, with Google and ZMOT, or ZMOT, depending on how you want to say Z or Z, but it stands for zero moment of truth. So in retail, we're all familiar with moment of truth, right? We're all familiar with that concept. Well, Google had, had put out a report a couple of years ago, ZMOT, zero moment of truth. And that's the fact that it, it be about 70 to 85% of consumers go to Google and they type in whatever it is that they're thinking about about a particular product or service. Why? Because they want to see what others have to say about it. And from that, the purchase decision is made before they've gone to your website potentially, before they've walked into your retail store, they've read the either content that you created and put on the web, or what others have, in the form of reviews or feedback have placed on the web. So the reason why content is so important, whether it's produced or user generated, is the fact that you want to make sure that your brand is represented in that space so that when somebody's on mobile and they, and they type in your product or your service, it comes up and something good is said about the brand. That's why user generated as well as produced content is so critical in this piece. Another form of content is also can be seen in offer, and most of us don't think of offers as content, but certainly promotions are, right? So maybe that is a premium with purchase, maybe that's bundling, uh, whatever it is that you might be uh, doing to attract people or put a spotlight on whatever it is that you're, you're trying to get them to focus on at that point in time. Whenever you do have an offer, though, you need to make sure that it's useful, you want to make sure that it has value, and you want to make sure that it's timely. That's what's really key about mobile as well, too. You're using um, you know, proximity, or you're using notifications, or you're using Bluetooth, wireless, whatever, uh, Wi-Fi, whatever it might be, to push out to the customer. The offer needs to be, again, timely value, and it has to, of course, be useful to the consumer to do that. And again, there's, I have the stats there, so you can take a look at that as I speak. So the third thing I want to talk about in terms of content, about being mobile friendly. What good is it to have really good videos, really nice photos, 
have a have a web page that's optimized to the point where you've got great user feedback and reviews that are on there, but the site doesn't load at the time the consumer needs it. Right? So imagine they're in store and they're looking at a product, but they want to know what others have to say about it. So they go to your website and they're on their mobile and the images or the video don't download because you didn't optimize your site properly. If you've got really good content, you want to make sure that your mobile site is, is well optimized. You also want to make sure that you have a well optimized mobile site too, because Google starting on May 1st did what? Everybody familiar with what Google did starting on May 1st? If you don't have a mobile optimized site, you will be penalized in your search rankings. Google is mandating that every website be mobile optimized now. So that's another reason why you want to make sure that your, your site is mobile friendly. When we get to the last aspect, I'll focus a bit more uh, on that as well. The second item that I want to talk about that McKinsey in one of their studies, actually they did three studies on it this past year, about digital Darwinism. And we all know what Darwinism is, survival of the fittest, origin of the species. Well, we're reaching a point in time in digital where now we're beginning to cannibalize ourselves. The survival of the fittest. Before it was, you gotta be on digital. Now that just about everybody is on digital, it's about now who's going to reign supreme, who's best optimizing their site, who's best putting, who's putting the best content online that's engaging, uh, etc. An example I wanna give is Disney, particularly Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. They've created something called My Disney Experience. Anybody familiar with My Disney Experience? My Disney Experience is where they use RFID technology for a magic band. What happens is you'll book your vacation, you'll select your type of magic band, and they will mail it out to you, you and your guests. This magic band has all of your preferences that you, you fill out a survey, and all of your preferences are loaded onto the band. Uh, your credit card information is there because you can use it to, it's your room key, you can use it uh, as your credit card to shop. You can also then use it to book in advance all of your rides. But up to two years in advance now, you can book your entire trip to Walt Disney World in Florida to the pinpoint of I will go to the Magic Kingdom on Monday, I will go to Epcot Center on Tuesday. On Monday, I will ride on Big Thunder Mountain at exactly 2.05 p.m. And at 3.30 p.m., I will have lunch at this particular restaurant. And actually, I will order this particular item. And when I leave the park that day, I want to get uh, uh, an Anna and Elsa plush toy so that I, you know, I can bring them back uh, you know, to play with before I uh, tuck in in bed that night. So that's how scripted it can be two years in advance. But think about from the business perspective, from an operations management, from a supply chain, resource planning. So that it's, it's just a, a wealth of, of being able to really understand the customer before the customer even steps foot onto your property. It's also great for future marketing campaigns as well, too. So this is really, uh, Disney invested $1 billion in this technology. It, went, it was in one year of beta, and it's now been in its first year of operation. I'm really curious to see future studies that will talk about this, because this is the, obviously the way that all businesses can go moving uh, forward with really being able to engage with their customer. I encourage you to take a look and, and research about that. I want to talk to you about the three aspects of segmentation quickly that McKinsey discussed. And the first is experimenters. So if you're segmenting our audience when we're talking about digital, we have what are called experimenters. Experimenters are on both ends of the spectrum. They could be the people that are more traditional, who are just first getting their feet wet into digital, their first time doing online shopping. And yes, there are still people who have never shopped online. I know it's hard to believe, but there are people who have never done it. They still feel that it's not safe to put their credit card online. They haven't, they haven't done, been there yet. But if they do, they're experimenting. Then we have the other end of the spectrum. It's the generation that grew up with a, a smartphone and with a, an iPad in their hand, let's say, from birth. They don't even know what a real magazine or a book is. They think it's an iPad. They don't know how to swipe the page of a book, but they know how to swipe the page uh, on, on a mobile device. Then once they have a PayPal account, once they are given access to a credit card and can run up in-app purchases while gaming, they, they, they're an experimenter as well too. And of course, they're gonna jump very quickly into the next category, which are called informed and engaged. Most of us are in this category. We, we're informed, we're engaged, we're using mobile, we're still doing traditional as well too. It's working for us. The problem is though, the more and more we do it, the more and more we begin to expect from brands. How many of us are getting quite spoiled by the process now? I know I get quite spoiled. Last year, Apple rolled out with Apple Pay, with their iBeacons, they rolled out the technology in all of their US Apple stores. 
where you could, the technology is so good that you could walk into the store, you were to pick up, so if I had an iPhone 6 in my pocket, let's say, and I walked over and I picked up an iPhone 6 Plus, I would receive a, a push notification telling me, oh, if you were to trade in your iPhone 6 today, you could walk out of the store with the iPhone 6 Plus for this amount of money. Or would you like to get a case for your iPhone 6 Plus today if I had walked over to the accessory section? That technology is brilliant. But anyway, I walk into the flagship store in Boston last year, and the beacons didn't work. I went and I asked, the, being the tech nerd that I am, I went and I asked the, the store manager, hey, I've got all my notifications set. I've, you know, I've got the shopping cart set. Why isn't it working? And so the manager said, oh, nobody's used it, so we turned the beacons off. So I went, oh, okay, all right, great. Then he's like, just give me a few minutes. I'll boot them all up, and um, you can test it out all you want. It was a fantastic experience. A lot of consumers are still in this phase. They're informed, they're engaged, but not all of us are. As we become more and more engaged, we move into the next category, which are fully digital. I would probably put myself in the category as I'm a fully digital consumer now. And that means that I'm a pain in the you know what. That means that I'm the guy that walks into the Apple store and wants to know why the beacons aren't working. As more and more consumers become fully digital, what do brands have to do? Brands have to be very careful now to make sure that they're offering a very unique, seamless experience because their customers are going to demand it. One of the problems as well, too, is that all of us have a, the, most of us anyway, have a leading edge device in our pocket. And where you know the refresh cycle six or twelve months, we're on we're on the cusp of, of, of technology all the time. It's very difficult for enterprise to be on the cusp of technology. So enterprise is typically lacking behind the consumer. And whereas that might have been okay before when refresh rates were a lot slower, that's not okay now. So enterprise has to be ahead of the curve. And you as a marketer or you in IT, you have to really be thinking about what is the next trend going to be? How many of you guys are ready for Apple Watch? How many of you have, have done a retail strategy that engages with, con uh, with consumers with a wearable device? Most of us, the answer is no, we haven't done that yet. You're gonna hear some great things from, from Sandra from Adidas uh, about some innovation that they have, but a lot of brands are not ahead of the curve. And you have to make sure that you are or as more and more consumers become fully digital, you're going to lose them. Getting to technology, I want to give you an example of a company called Meatpack. How many people have heard of Meatpack before? Hmm, how many people shop at Meatpack? None of us, because it's in Guatemala. In Guatemala, this, this is a, Meatpack is a multi-brand store. They sell a lot of sporting good items as well. And what they did is they came up with this really cool app called Hijack. And the Hijack app works in this way. You have to, of course, have, have downloaded the app. When you walk into a shopping mall, if you walk into a competitor's store, all of a sudden you'll get a notification that says you can buy the same item from us for less money. Starting right now, the discount starts at 100%, and as soon as you get into our store, the counter will stop. So it's been a great engagement tool because you've got people running through the shopping malls. Yeah, you, you really, you have to Google this to see some of the video of it. It's fantastic. People are jumping over escalators, pushing people out of the way to run into the store to get the most discount. Any item in the store, they can get it at that discount if they can get there in time. Anyway, it can be a bit dangerous, but it certainly, it got a lot of uh, global attention. Really, when you talk about engaging the customer and then also getting the intangibles about having great content uh, talked about your brand after that, Meatpack was quite successful with that. What is the best way to engage with your customer? As I just mentioned, Meatpack did it with smartphones and with an app, but it can certainly be done with tablets. It can be done uh, in the future, of course, with wearables, whether that be Google Glass version you know, 2.0, Samsung's on its whatever third or fourth version of its wearable, and Apple Watch is debuted in a few markets, but it's not readily available just yet. So it'll be interesting to see where wearables play. If you look at just some of the statistics, and if you're ever looking for mobile engagement statistics in Southeast Asia, we are socials are great. I rely on them heavily for their data. But if you look, uh, the Philippines is quite different than the other markets that I've spoken in on this topic, in that you guys are still, 70% of your internet consumption is still happening on desktop and laptop, which is quite different than, the, than most of Southeast Asia. And it must all be generated from this area, not, uh, not of course, from, from most of the, the outlying uh, uh, islands but it's down 13%.
So you're looking at about six hours and 17 minutes a day spent on that platform. The smartphone, though, is up 70%, and that's true in just about every market. And then tablet usage, unlike most of the world, tablet usage in, in the Philippines is up. Tablet usage in most other markets is actually on its way down, mainly because of the fact that we're all getting larger phones. So as we get a larger phone, we don't need to be carrying right, our tablet and our large phone at the same time, unless, of course, we've got multiple, you know, ladies, you guys got bags. I, I, you know, I, I try to tuck my iPad under here, but my iPhone 6 Plus is, is getting big enough, I guess. We also, when we're talking about engagement platforms, what are some of the best ways to do it? Certainly, social networking sites would be one of them. Mobile web is another, and of course, dedicated apps or web-based apps. As a consultant, I, typically people come to me and they say, Ron, I need to have a mobile engagement strategy. What should I do? I want to build an app. And I usually immediately get them, no, you don't need to build an app. What you first need to do is have a mobile responsive website. My first piece of advice ever is if you want to go digital and you want to engage with your customers, the very first thing you do is you make your website mobile friendly. And then you and then when you talk about dedicated app versus a, a web-based app, my second piece is do a web-based app, then test the waters, and then maybe perhaps go to a dedicated app. But utilizing this technology, it's about uh, chat, uh, chat apps, for example, Line. I know Line isn't very big here, but in Thailand, Line is just like WhatsApp, but with emojis. It's been a very successful retail tool about driving engagement and flash sales. What new or clever thing could your brand do? Perhaps you could come up with your own messaging platform or you could piggyback on somebody else's and create a new community where you could begin to engage with them. It's about your technology being responsive and it's also about if you're using a dedicated app, it's about being able to have a wall ecosystem to do a communication directly between you and the brand with no other distractions. When we talk about, as I was mentioning about uh, in the Apple store with iBeacon, of course, you can use Wi-Fi, and there's Wi-Fi a, a technology product called Wi-Fi Slam. There's another one, Wi-Fi Max. There's some interesting ways to engage in store with proximity. But of course, you've got uh, iBeacon from Apple, and of course, you've got e-wallets. The key is, however you're engaging on mobile, you want to make the, the um, environment or the sales journey seamless. You also want to make it complete. And that's what's really great about mobile, whether or not somebody's in your store, touching the product and then ordering it online, or looking at it online and then physically buying it in the store. You want the path to purchase to be seamless. You don't want there to be any hurdle along the way. Because at any time that there's a hurdle, you give the customer the chance to look for the product someplace else. And if they look for the product someplace else, there's a good chance they might buy it. And, at some place else. So you want to make sure that your engagement is the best that it can be. It's seamless, it's engaging, and you actually are offering them some value. You're offering them, whether it's premium with purchase or with better service, some aspect that differentiates you from the competition. So it's about engagement, it's about relevance, and it's about creating value. My final point that I want to share with you and ask the question, how many of you are ready to go 100% mobile? Are any of your businesses ready to go 100 for not digital? How many of you are ready to go 100% mobile? And you don't have to answer, but most businesses, the answer to that question is no way. I'm not ready to do that. How many people are familiar with uh, Flipkart? Anybody shop or use Flipkart before? Well, in India, uh, Flipkart recently acquired uh, Mantra, and what, it's an online shopping platform, both of them are. But they made the decision also on May 1st to go 100% app. So not even 100% mobile, 100% dedicated app. And they've been preparing their customers for the, for the past six months by offering them an incentive to download and begin to shop on the app. Once they do, they, they receive the discount. They shuttered their website. Can you imagine shuttering your website? Can you imagine your business being so successful on mobile that you just shutter the site and you say all transactions with us happened in our app. It's not conceivable right now for most of our business, most people's businesses, but it was conceivable for this, for this brand in India. And why was that? Because 80% of the traffic was done on their mobile app already and 60% of their sales were done at the time. And now they, they felt that that was good enough that they're gonna go for a full 100%. Boston Consulting Group did a study on this and they found that in India, both urban consumers as well as rural consumers were actually shopping for the same items. But due to the limited connect connectivity to the web, 
they needed to make sure the connection had to be stable and that the, basically the experience needed to be seamless. And the only way for them to truly do this was to do it with their dedicated app. It's a bit avant-garde, it's a bit risky, and I'm not advocating that your business all of a sudden close your website tomorrow, close your retail store, I'm not saying that whatsoever. This is where the technology is headed. This is where we as consumers are headed. Somebody asked me after the last uh, session that I did for SAP in Singapore, they said, well, what do you see happening to traditional retail? And it's a question that I always get. Is traditional retail going to die? And the answer is, is that, I mean, I don't know, but I've got to say that the answer to that is no. And that is because at the end of the day, we're social. And even though we've done a lot of our socializing on social media, we still like to go to stores. We still like to congregate together. And especially as more and more people don't eat at home, we still need to go out and have dinner in a restaurant. And what do we typically do before that dinner or after that dinner? Go so we'll browse through the shopping mall. So it's really about creating on and offline strategies that truly engage with the customer to keep them coming to our stores, whether it's digital or it's, a, or it's physical, so virtual or physical brick and mortar location, and about, about making that transaction, that, uh, that path to purchase seamless. I appreciate your time today as I touched on uh, these three aspects. So I want to caution you though, that under digital Darwinism, if you look at the statistics, some brands are so successful now online, they've created so much content over the past few years. The ideation is that this brand, the brand can never be supplanted as long as they continue at the same pace because they've got so much content. So the question is, how much longer is your company going to wait before you're generating and putting content online? Because if you don't start now, that critical mass piece is coming where it may be too late. So I'm not saying it'll, it'll be too late for your brand, but there's a potential that if you don't start doing some of the things that I talked about today, it may be too late for your company. Don't sit in the dark, get started. I thank you very much for your time today. I truly appreciate it. There's some great people here from SAP to answer your questions as well too, and I'll be hanging around for the rest of the day during the breaks if you, if you want to chat and talk about some of these things. And have a great rest of your day. And I know Sandra's up next, looking forward to her, hearing her presentation. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed our discussion today. Remember, whatever happens in this kitchen should never stay in this marketing kitchen. I hope you will share Marketing Kitchen TV with your friend. With fresh content always simmering on our storytelling stovetop, I look forward to seeing you in the next Marketing Kitchen TV episode. Hold it all to someday.